Good morning. So my name is Murray, one of the pastors here in Grace, Saskatoon. Glad that you can join us. Uh, we're in a summer series in the Psalms, and this week in particular, we're looking at Psalm 42. We'll also give a look at Psalm 43, because these Psalms are often read and sung together, and so they're sort of a, a single Psalm that's divided uh, into those two pieces. So we'd love to have you follow along, as was said earlier on the, on the handout, you should be able to find an outline you can follow along there. And on the back side of that sheet, there will be further study so that you can dig into with your gospel community or alone. And there's also a few Bibles still left here. So if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to come down here, grab one of those blue Bibles on the table, or just wave your hand. Maybe somebody will pass one up to you if you're, if you're fortunate. And uh, that way you can just follow along in the psalm that we can see what God has for us. The, the Westminster Shorter Confession, it, it makes a statement that says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. They recognized in writing that, that really delighting in God is actually what we were made for. And delighting in God is what we were saved for. We were saved to know and find our joy in the true and living God. In fact, true life, eternal life, uh, according to one of the closest disciples to Jesus, is actually knowing him. And it's only then can we think right, only then when the preeminent reality of, our, of God really becomes the preeminent reality in our thoughts and in our hearts, that's when we have right thinking. Because all of life is designed to really flow out of our treasuring and the enjoyment of God. And so if we, if we live and grow in our knowledge about God, but we don't actually grow in our delight in God, then we're only going to end up hardening our hearts in sin and hypocrisy. The ultimate purpose of all theology and all of life is not merely to gather information, but it's actually to know and to love and to enjoy God, the one who is the truth. And so this Psalm, Psalm 42, it actually is going to deal with a very dangerous condition of spiritual dryness. Those are those seasons when we find ourselves quite indifferent, cold, unmoved really to the, the wonder of who Jesus is, the wonder of all he's done for us, even as we believe the facts of it, we find it's not really bringing us a lot of joy and delight. But we don't want to simply have believing heads and unbelieving hearts. And so would you take a moment just before we begin, and I just want to take a moment, just would you pray for your own heart just before we begin reading and, and unpacking this psalm? Just pray for your heart that God would just be able to speak to you through this psalm and he would meet you in the words of this Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. Please pray for your heart this morning. So, Father, please speak to us, speak to each individual person here, Lord, because we need you. We need you to awaken our affections once again for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. So, Brian's here to read Psalm 42. Psalm 42, for the director of music, a masculine of the sons of Korah. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, my, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I'll remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? 
My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So in the introduction of this psalm, it says that this is a masculine, right? And scholars believe that that means this is a, a song that's actually meant to teach us something. It's a song meant for teaching. It's a psalm to teach us really how to navigate life in those times of spiritual dryness. So let's begin. And verse 1 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? So we've got this image, this deer uh, panting. This is not simply just a thirsty deer. This is not a coffee cup verse or a nice uh, painting that we have. This is a deer panting, which means it's in literal agony, dying of thirst, and has come now to the place where there used to always be flowing water, but now finds that this river riverbed is dry and everything around him is wilderness and a season of drought. So the comparison really is his soul is really like that perishing deer and God is like a dry riverbed. And so if we learn nothing else from this, I think we can learn our soul is thirsty. It's longing for real life. It's, it's needing living water. And our whole life is actually seeking to satisfy that thirst. The thirst of our souls. And we can try to do that by seeking to satisfy this thirst and things that will, will ultimately hurt us and harm us and lead to destruction. But even the good things will not ultimately satisfy nor last because we were created to find our home in a right relationship with God and drink of God himself as the headwaters of meaning and joy and delight. So the psalmist here is spiritually dehydrated. He, he still has the concept of God, right? He has that, uh, but he's thirsting, he says, for the living God in verse two. So you can see that God is not just the creator of life. You begin to see he is life. And he is the source of that life. He's the source of ultimate peace and joy and love and every good and perfect gift. So it's not like this person has stopped believing in God. But it's like God just seems distant. It's the, the personal sense of God's presence and love is not there. And then you see at the very end of verse 2, he says, When shall I come and appear before God? Literally, that's when shall I see the face of God? He's lost then the relational presence of God. And in fact, in verse 9, he asks God, why have you forgotten me? The thoughts of God then that used to comfort him and sweeten and strengthen him just don't resonate, doesn't, doesn't strike him, doesn't sort of awaken him and bring him to the wonder and awe and delight like it has in times past. So he's lost the reality of God and God's presence in his heart, in his soul. Though he still believes in God conceptually, he's not tasting him. He doesn't feel this relationship of, of joy with God, but rather just spiritual dryness, spiritual drought, spiritual depression, spiritual darkness, spiritual dullness. And it can be accompanied when this happens with a sense of guilt. Other psalms speak of this when the psalmist has done something wrong. And so then the psalmist has to confess his sin. His sin has moved him away from, from that closeness with God in his heart. But in this psalm, Psalm 42, that's not really mentioned specifically as the case here. Here it's just this deep experience of dryness of the soul that's come upon him, and it's not said even once, hinted at, that it's because of a specific sin or, this, or an onward repeating sin. He's just lost his awe of God. He's just lost his delight in the Redeemer. And so often when we feel dry, we figure that it's simply a matter of finding out what, what is it on our Christian to-do list that we need to do or that maybe we're not doing, we need to correct. And that's why often dry Christians don't often like to reveal to their friends how dry they actually are out of fear for how their friends might react. Maybe like Job's friends, uh, they'll give you counsel and they'll ask you, have you confessed all your sin? 
right? Have you had your quiet time? Have you, have you prayed in faith? Have, you, have you, re, you rebuked the devil? Have you pleaded the blood? Have you started to count your blessings one by one? You know, obviously you must be doing something wrong. But in this psalm, we're not told that this guy did anything wrong. He's actually going to the same riverbed, but this time it's dry, and he's just dying of spiritual thirst. And so there is nowhere in this psalm, like in some other psalms, that has him confessing his sin, where he says, you know, I hide my sins no longer, I repent of my wrong. It just doesn't say anything like that. So this condition can happen to you, and it may even be when you're still in the routine of reading your Bible and praying every day. And if you're a new Christian, this can really throw you for a loop, right? The first time you experience this dryness of soul, because often no one prepares you for it. And too often, the expectation is that this kind of thing just doesn't happen unless you're really doing something wrong. Then when it does happen, of course, people start to doubt. And maybe this whole thing was just a dream, right? And you can become very insecure. So if you're a newer Christian, you need to understand that, that this is coming and you need to learn how to deal with it. And that's why we're going to address this this morning to help you in the help that I think this Psalm 42 gives us. For many of us who have been followers of Jesus for a long time, we still don't react well and don't know how to respond. But we are in a war and there is, this is a battle of faith. The enemy of our souls is going to speak lies to your heart and do everything in his power to keep you from actually enjoying and delighting in God. And some people go off the rail for years after facing this dryness of soul. Because if you don't deal with it, then the empty dryness will start to just take over and even start to impact your intellect, do you think, and your belief. It can lead to deep reservations about God and deep reservations about yourself to the point you aren't even sure if you're a Christian or not. It just doesn't seem real. And maybe it's, it's been years ago that this has happened to you and you never quite got back on the rails. Well, God in this psalm, he wants to help you change that. So what are some of the possible factors that can bring about this spiritual drought, this spiritual dryness, this doubt? Well, one is, we see in the psalm, is disruption of community. Notice in verse 4, he says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I'd go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. And then at, down at the end of verse 6, he says, Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazar. So the writer used to be in Judah where the temple was, go to the temple as part of the regular worship, would be a part of the feasts and all the praise that would happen there there. He was actively involved. He was not simply just a spectator. And notice, he actually led the procession. And he responded to the truth of God's word with glad shouts, these glad shouts to awaken his own heart and awaken the hearts of those around him. So he was engaged in everything that was going on. It says he sang the songs of praise so that he could press the truths really into his heart and to help the others press that truth into their hearts as well. Because praise is something the scripture tells us actually completes the joy. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We belong to him. We are his own. That you, that's plural, that's you all, that you all may proclaim really together the excellencies of him who called you all out of darkness into his marvelous light. In fact, that's why I'm always trying to get you to respond. Not because uh, really it's for my sake, but really I want you to respond for the sake of your own soul and for the sake of those around you because it completes your joy. It will complete the joy that he wants us to have in him. And so in his active commitment and engagement in these regular gatherings, his soul would be refreshed. But now it seems, for whatever reason, he's away from the community. He's away from their celebrations. He's in the North Country. We don't know why. Don't know if he was captured. Did he just move there? What happened? 
but he needs a couple things. One, as a follower of Jesus, there's individual Bible study and there's corporate community Bible study. There's individual prayer and contemplation and there's also corporate prayer and praise. And they are not the same and you need them both. You need them both. And so here the psalmist is longing for those times, the gatherings, the feasts, where the people would come together, they would read scripture, they would remember the great things that God has done, they would remember how he has delivered them, and they would recommit themselves and praise God together. And so we can tend to underestimate the importance of the communal aspects of the Christian life because we often, especially in the West, we've got a tendency to be individualistic, thinking that we can be this spiritual person all by ourselves. But that's really opposed to everything the Bible teaches about the corporate nature of the redeeming work of Christ. He died to form this new humanity, one body, to be a spirit-filled community So you just aren't designed to stay hot by yourself. How can you be a displaced finger, right? Displaced from the body and function as you're designed to be, right? A brick by itself is not a temple. It needs to be fitted together with other living stones. And so that's all through the scripture. So the psalmist, he does not underestimate the community like we sometimes do. Right? And then we're surprised when we fall into spiritual dryness. But even if we come physically to church, right, we can still come as an individual and stay isolated. We can come to get our, our, our fix for what's in it for me. right? We can talk to a few individuals, usually our friends, people we're comfortable with and know, and then we go home to our own thing. So we go to church kind of fitting gathering in around our agenda, our plans, our convenience, rather than this committed connection with a local church as part of our redeemed calling and identity. And so we don't like to necessarily always make ourselves accountable and a part of community because, well, we're busy, right? And maybe we're just private for a whole variety of reasons. But because church community, here's another thing, because church communities always always changing. It's always on the move. It's growing, it's shrinking, it's changing, things are adapting. So that means unless you're actively reconstructing community and building into others, unless you're intentionally reaching out, you're going to very soon feel out of the loop. You're going to be disconnected. You're going to be calling out from Mount Mazar. Why is my soul cast down? Why is there such turmoil within me? So that means you have to keep being intentional to build new relationships. You have to keep building into relationships you do have. There's just no way around it because it's commitment that actually leads to connectedness. So we can vastly underestimate the things that God is doing in and through just our regular gathering as we just truly engage and we can vastly underestimate the danger of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together for just that ongoing mutual encouragement that we need. So being disconnected from true gospel community can lead to soul dryness. Then secondly, disillusionment with the events of life, right? Where is your God? That's the accusation coming towards him in verse three and at the end of verse 10, right? So the enemy is taunting him, right? And and his doubts that he's bringing out, they're hitting home. Like they're really getting him to, to doubt in his heart. So people are saying these things and it's just, yeah, it just adds to what's already festering there is this doubt. And things are happening in his circumstances that, that he either knows about or he's experiencing that just doesn't seem to fit with his understanding of a holy and just and good and wise God. Because if God is so good, then why is this happening? And the psalmist just starts to echo these suggestions of doubt. Yeah, like, why is this happening to me? And how does that fit in with a God who's supposed to be in control of things, right? And so you see his present circumstances are actually mocking his faith in God. Look at verse 7. He says, deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. 
So here the psalmist describes his situation as the deep. Now there's not being able to sort of keep his head above water. Totally different metaphor now. It's like now he's been in the drought. So now you want some water? Okay, now he's drowning, right? And so he can't breathe. It's like he can't get a deep breath. And so he just cries out from the depths of his suffering and stress and darkness and turmoil, all his lack of peace, no relief. And he just feels like he's drowning under it all. And then look at verse 9. He says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now, why is everything just gone so wrong? Verse 10, as with a deadly wound in my bones, that's how he feels on the inside. My adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Where is your God? So when things go wrong, it can just lead to this time of spiritual dryness and despair where you just no longer feel the just the close and affirming presence of God. And we just don't tend to think, yeah, imagine if all this happened and, if I, and I didn't have you, Jesus. No, we tend to think, why is God allowing this? Or is it just me? Yeah. So, disruption of community. Secondly, the disillusionment with the events of life where even uh, his enemies that start to feed his unbelief. And then we can just feel like we're sinking and forgotten. We're left wondering, is, is God even there? If he's there, surely he doesn't care. And then the third thing that can happen, spiritual dryness can come due to deprivation physically. He says in verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night. I tell you, tears doesn't sound like a very satisfying meal to me. Doesn't sound like he's eating well. Lost his appetite, right? Which is a sign of depression, right? And sleeplessness. Right? He's crying out day and night. So he's awake day and night. Right? And so you can't deal with the overall condition if you ignore physical aspects of it. So it could be that other things that have actually led him to this dryness, but then he's not going to be able to pull out of it unless he gets some rest and some food. The physical may be partly responsible for the spiritual condition you're experiencing. Are you overtired? Are you worn down? Sometimes it's not pray more, it's remember you're weak, you're a finite human, you need some rest, you might need some good food and some exercise and fresh air, it will impact the whole you. Lies, stress, your physical condition, right, all impact you. So now we're going to look at the four things that I see the psalmist does that he tells us in this teaching song what he does to actually deal with his dryness. One, he pours out his soul. Secondly, he's going to refocus his hope. Thirdly, he remembers the grace and love of God. And then fourthly, he preaches the gospel to his own heart. So let's look at the first thing he does. He pours out his soul. That's verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, he says. So in this psalm, he pours out his soul. That, that means he's being real, right? He's saying it. I, I, I'm getting nothing out of worship. I'm getting nothing out of my Bible reading, right? I, I just don't sense God at all, right? I'm panting. I just feel so dry, right? The riverbed is dry. So when that happens, he says, pour out your soul. But I don't feel anything. Yeah, well, pour out your soul. This whole psalm is his prayer of pouring out his soul. The psalmist is being absolutely real with God. Why? God knows it anyway. God already knows. And he's expressing then honestly where he's at in his deep coldness of heart, in his suffering, in his despair, in his dryness, his grief, his fears, his longings. That's real communion with God. He is being genuine and real. So talk to God about how you're getting nothing out of it. Talk to God about the coldness of your heart, right? Be real to God in your desperation. Lord, you know my heart. You know right now that, yeah, I still have the knowledge in my head, the facts in my head, Lord, but it's not awakening or stirring my affections for you. And talk about to God how much you miss him and how much you want to be able to enjoy and delight in him. And, and ask him, Lord, don't let my heart grow cold. Please don't let my heart grow cold. Now is the time to also run to your Bible 
and to pray in reality with that dryness, right? Pray this psalm, Psalm 42. Pray with a brother or sister. Ask God to awaken your dull heart and obey what God says as the very means he's given us to strengthen our faith by running to community. And then the second thing he does, he refocuses his hope. There's three times he asks himself, why are you cast down on my soul? You can see it in verse 5. It's there again in verse 11, and it's in Psalm 43, verse 5. The very same thing. Why are you cast down, O my soul? So he's digging into a reason for his turmoil, his dullness, right? He's, he's looking to see where am I got, where's my wrong thinking here? Where am I believing a lie? Soul, what's actually going on here? What am I believing that's not true? And then based on his answer, it seems he's misplaced his hope, right? It seems like he's put his hope somewhere and he's lost it in the back, somewhere in the back of the pantry. And so he just doesn't see it or access it. He's been looking for happiness, meaning, significance, and his identity and security in something other than God. That's what he's discovering. He's been putting his hope in some things, and these things are what's letting him down. So here, he's not going to allow his emotions to dictate to his mind. He's going to keep his feelings in check, realizing that he must keep his hope in the Lord. You see, feelings, they always need to be treated like a toddler, right? You buckle them in the back seat. You don't let them drive, and neither do you put them in the trunk, right? They're in the back seat, buckled in. That's what you do with your feelings. So he examines his heart for misplaced hope. And what's his answer? Hope in God, he says. Right? Idols, false hopes, they're going to let you down. So he says, I need to relocate my hope. Right? That's your significance, your identity in God, in his salvation, that he's our God. We belong to him. So you need to examine at these times, in what are you trusting? In what are you resting? Do you need to refocus and redirect your hope from certain expectations and desires maybe that you have? And God is showing us that we can have real hope in God without having everything else and everything in our lives all figured out. Thirdly, he then remembers the grace and loving kindness of God. Right? Verse 6, where he says, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. And his pain then causes him to remember God. That's an active remembrance where he runs to God and he calls this to mind. He remembers the character of God. Right? In verse 7, he says, it's your waterfalls, your breakers, your waves. So he reminds himself that God is sovereign and he's in control and that he's good. And he has proven himself faithful and trustworthy over and over again. He reminds himself of God's steadfast love in verse 8. In Hebrew, that's chesed. It's covenant faithfulness. It's unmerited grace and love of a sovereign God. God's deep love is what answers our deep cry. So in our deep need, you cry to the deeper mercy and love of God. He ponders the, the grace of God, and he actually turns it into a song that he sings to himself because he wants to use the truth that he knows about who God is as a weapon. And then fourthly, he's learned to preach to his heart. He stops listening to himself, and he starts preaching to himself. He stops listening to his heart and the words of unbelief, and he actually starts preaching to his heart. He starts preaching to his soul. We see it in verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. He's preaching to himself. He says, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. The root word of that, my salvation, is Jesus. The name Jesus means Yah, or the Lord, is my salvation. So there's my Jesus. He's praying. And he repeats it in verse 11. So you can spend your day listening to yourself or preaching to yourself. Because your thought life is usually the biggest influence in your life. 
as soon as you wake up in the morning, your heart starts babbling to you. Oh no, what about this? What's, what's going on with this person? And, and what will they think about me? And how is this all going to turn out? And what am I going to do? And I, I'm such a screw up. This is a disaster. What's the use? And I need more sleep. And so you have to grab your heart by the heart and say, shut up, heart, and listen to this. I have 14 bottles of hope in my pantry, right? Got it on right here. I got 14 bottles of hope. They're already in the pantry, right? And they've all been bought, and they've all been paid for, and they've all been put there by Jesus, my salvation. He is my hope. And nothing will separate me from his steadfast love. He knows me at my worst. He knows absolutely everything about me. And he has chosen to love me. You see, you have to be a preacher. Not just me. You have to be a preacher and you have to know your audience. You need to know where your audience is putting their hope in. Why you cast down? What are you thinking, Murray? You have to know what your fears are in. Why are you afraid? And you have to learn how to preach the gospel of the grace of Jesus to your own heart. You have to learn how to ring your heart's bell. As you remind yourself of your heart's and your soul's hope and anchor. Why are you like this? Why are you being so defensive? Why are you trying to justify yourself? Why, why are you so anxious? You've forgotten his steadfast covenant love. You've forgotten his gracious favor. You've forgotten all that he has done for you. You've forgotten his great forgiveness. And by the time he gets to Psalm 43 in verses 4 and 5, he's already starting to have his heart lift. He's not there yet where he wants to be, but it's starting to lift. It's happening slow, but it's happening. And he's using music there. He starts to sing out light and truth to his heart that this God, the God of the universe, the redeeming God, he gets to call my God, my God. So when your soul is cast down, when I think God has finally just given up on me, I'm such an idiot, I'm such a failure, right? I'd give up on me. The psalmist preaches to his heart and he says, no, I will yet praise him. He says, I shall again praise him. And notice, I love this because this shows the realism of this psalmist, right? He doesn't say, hope in God, I now praise him and just instantly just put on the happy face. No, that would be denial, and nor does he say, hope in God, I'll never praise him again. That would be despondency. But what does he say? Hope in God, I shall again praise him. Here we see this progression, just bit by bit, moving out of the dumps. He will not abandon me. He is a loving, gracious God. He is my salvation and my God. So he's singing this truth to awaken his heart, right? So how do I know God will not abandon me? How can I be assured of his steadfast love, especially when I don't feel it or I don't see it in my circumstances? Well, I think we need to read Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 and hear it as the words of Jesus. You see, Jesus is the dying deer in this psalm. Jesus is the one with the deadly wound. He, he always drank deeply from the streams of God's love. He always enjoyed and delighted in the riches like this stream of abundance that he had as part of the Trinity. But here he's truly forsaken by God. Think of him. He who had the lead in the throng of the host of heaven in all its praise, and all its joy, now cast out. And he didn't just go down forsaken from moving from the land of Jordan and Jerusalem to the north by Mount Hermon and Mount Mazar. No, he came from heaven to this broken earth. And it wasn't just Mount Mazar. He was on Mount Calvary. 
Mount Calvary where he was experiencing this on a bloody Roman cross. He who had experienced just the joy and praise of heaven, he went under the deep breakers and waves of judgment and damnation. And when he cried out for help, he got just the fullness of wrath over him. So listen to the faithful one who really was dying of the ultimate cosmic thirst. Listen to the one who panted from that cross. I thirst. So read Psalm 42 and you just hear the agony of the voice of him who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forsaken me? See, it's Jesus whose enemies taunted, where's your God? Let's see if God will just, will come and save him. And Jesus didn't just lose the feeling of God. He lost the face of God. God his Father turned his back on him and gave him up to wrath and suffering and death. And when Jesus was thirsty, all he got is vinegar on a sponge on the end of a stick. And why was Jesus thirsty? Why was he forsaken? So that no matter your failures, in all your inadequacy, in all your coldness, all your dullness of heart, in all your doubts and struggles, God will never give up on you. God will not forsake you. God will never leave you. No matter how dry you feel, you'll not get vinegar. The only son of God, the only child of God who was ever forsaken was Jesus. Because of Jesus, we may feel forsaken, but we will never be. So our hope is not that next week will be better than last week was, or that we'll finally get a better prime minister and, and government, or that we'll solve the divisions of our country with our own ingenuity. No, our anchor and our hope is Jesus. And listen to what our hope is. Jesus said in John 12, 27, he says, now is my soul troubled. That's a strong word there he uses. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Notice he's preaching to his own heart and soul. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. And God treated Jesus and punished him and gave him what you deserve so that you can receive his committed love and grace unconditionally, freely, for no merit or cause in you. So preach Jesus, full of grace, to yourself. And when you get back on the path, you'll be far more humble, far stronger in faith, and with more joy than before. Because this psalm, like all the Bible, it's for me, but it's ultimately about Jesus. He is the one who was dry and thirsty with the deadly wound. He was the one who was forsaken and cast from the presence and joy of God. He who was face to face with God in intimacy did not see the face of God so that no matter how dry I feel, the presence of God is in me, all around me, face to face with God, and that should start to kindle a love and delight for the God who has first loved us. Let's pray. In fact, as we pray, why don't you turn to Psalm 43, since you're right there, hopefully. Let's start with praying Psalm 43. I'm going to pick it up at verse 3. So you can that way, pray with your eyes open, pray looking at the Bible, Psalm 43, 3. So Lord, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us. Jesus, you are that light and truth. Bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God. That's the place of sacrifice, the cross. To God, my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre. That's guitar or any other stringed instrument you got. Oh God, my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? 
hope in God, for I shall again praise you, my salvation and my God. Oh, Lord, just make it real to us, Father, what your son did, so that as we sing, as we break bread together, may the truth that we know in our heads just capture our hearts and just shape our understanding of who you really are and what the reality of the gospel truly means for us. So may this message this morning, Lord, be a light and truth to lead us to your holy hill, to the place of sacrifice where Jesus ascended, bearing his cross, crucified, entering into our suffering, taking the sin, the root of all suffering, so we could live in eternity with you as our Abba Father, with no more suffering, no more depression, no more doubts, no more anguish, but shalom, peace, fullness of peace inside and out. Lord, we know in this world we'll not be free from discouragement, but we're called to live in dependence on you. So teach us how to pour out our soul in complete honesty to you, to refocus our hope from idols to hope in you, Jesus. To remember the grace and steadfast love you have for us that we can behold so beautifully in you, Jesus. May we preach the gospel and its promises to our own heart. Help us to delight in you. And it's all because of you, Jesus. Amen.